Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll pass from So uh, we will uh, pass now to from um, uh, our final documents that Eugenia, in fact, first, for the first time discovered where uh, how uh, the authorities perceived Batedin functioning in late 18th, early 19th century, from that period when indeed interference of uh, Russian government into adjudication of uh, civil affairs, at least, by Jews themselves, was minimal, will pass to mid-19th century, when attempts to change this situation have been taken, and then we'll get to the late 19th century, when, indeed, the full-fledged system of relations between Russian law and Jewish law between Russian government and uh, court system and Jewish traditional court system, if we can call it this way, had been established. <clears throat> so indeed, and, uh, when Alexander II in the mid 19th century uh, started so-called great reforms and reformed Russian court system, he intended to legalize even Jewish courts, at least for family matters, obviously. However, this never happened. And till the end of the 19th century, and in fact, till the end of the Russian Empire, uh, Batedin had no official status in Russian legal system, despite the fact that there was a position of crown Jews, of, of crown uh, rabbis, sorry, crown rabbis who were responsible in the eyes of the government for uh, family uh, issues among the Jews, and, and they were responsible in the rabbi for registering divorces. So obviously, <coughs> crown Jews had to explain every time almost had to explain somehow to the government why they need a rabbinic court. Uh, and presenting it as a kind of small ritual they can do without, but still you should, it doesn't matter so much. So there was this uh, unclear situation, but in fact this unclear situation came to be uh, recognized at some moment, and I would like to draw your attention to how finally Russian government found a way to recognize Jewish um, uh, uh, Jewish rabbinical courts in its system. So there was, uh, I'll go fast, I think two uh, people here saw already this presentation, I'll do it fast and then I'll switch to the second part. So uh, it went, um, there was, uh, from the point of view of Jewish law, of course, there were uh, there was spiritual rabbi, and the, from the point of view of state law, there was crown rabbi, style state rabbi, if you like. And of course, spiritual rabbi did not hide from anyone that he is, uh, uh, he, he abides by uh, this or that Allahic authority and addresses the Allahic authority difficult questions. In case of uh, necessity of Eter Mirabonim, obviously, this always was uh, clear to him, to Allah authority, and to Jews living in the uh, in this town. But there was a problem with presenting this issue, even of Adam Merabon and of uh, a rabbinical court, to town state rabbi, and even more difficult issue for town state rabbi to explain why he needs this to the government. If there is a problem, and if wife and husband start a civil litigation, then the town state rabbi has to explain somehow why there was all the story of, of uh, rabbinical courts involved. So uh, in, in the archives we have a, a president of a rabbinical court um, uh, that uh, uh, were together set Rabbi Chaim Berlin, Malkiel Tan, uh, Tannenbaum and uh, Rabbi Epstein of uh, Orpa Shulfan, <coughs> they 
were summoned together, so this was a, an important case from the point of Jewish law, but it was no less important from the point of view of state law, as we'll see right now. <clears throat> so they uh, sat together and they wrote uh, a decision in which they said that they permit to an abandoned husband to remarry. A typical decision. We find quite a few like this in the Shavuot of each of the three Halakhic uh, personalities uh, who participated in the proceeding. But what is, and one of the issues, again, it's, only, it's more or less found in all such decisions that they permit to remarry only after the husband gets a permit to remarry from the state. But let's uh, take a look at what, whether the state gives the permit to remarry. The state, the state rabbi, gives his permit to remarry only after they have a, per, a permit from the from rabbinical court or from or, or consent of hundred rabbis. But he has to explain this somehow to the authorities. So let's look how this situation went on. As you saw, like, like, just uh, remember that this uh, decision of Beijing that per gave a uh, permit to remarry took place in 1905. The system, the state system, after the halakha system already gave its answer, the state system didn't work as fast. So we have a regional governor office, and governors learn Jew, whose functions were the same as of Mahlakali Mishpat more or less, uh, in the mo a modern Israeli system. Uh, they had to explain to the, mini to the governor of the Ministry of Interior what is to be done from the point of Jewish law. But what's most interesting, that most uh, uh, important representatives of Jewish community, rabbis and non-rabbis as well, were summoned once in a decade to a rabbinical commission by the Minister of Interior himself. And he was ready to listen to this commission. It was not a body in the Ministry of Interior. It was an independent body from which he was ready to listen advices. He would seek their advice and only sometimes would tell them that he is not ready to this or that compromise. But they would search for a compromise together. So, of course, it, it, was, not a, it was a system far from an ideal, but still, this was a place where a real dialogue between two legal systems took place. And in the proceedings of the of rabbinical commissions, we find the explanations of problematic Jewish law issues, problematic from the point of view of encounter with Russian law, explanations that the rabbinical commission was not afraid to present to the minister himself, sometimes in criticizing the law openly. But I'll show you very fast how this um, particular case of which we saw a decision by most respected rabbinical figures, how it passed through the state system. So if abandonment took place in 1892, state rabbi denied right to remarry in 1904, saying that there was no yet passed due in a due way. We are not going to enter into the tricks of the case. <clears throat> so the Jew appealed to regional governor, appealed the decision of state rabbi. And the uh, markets yet before the uh, rabbinical court uh, was convened. But then, simultaneously it seems, he incited spiritual rabbi of the town to convene a rabbinical court, which took place as you saw. At the same time, we find the opinion of governor's learned Jew. But what the learned Jew said, he said, you have to convene a rabbinical court, as if he had no way to be informed, or the Jew had no way to inform the learned uh, uh, correligioner in, in the governor's office that the big deal already takes place or is going to take place. 
So learn to yourself. You have to submit a big, uh, you have to convene a big team in order to grant um, the guy permit to remember. And without such decision of Beijing, obviously you cannot give such a permit to remember. The case is passed to Ministry of Interior with no information about the permit to remember already given by the uh, rabbinical court. And the fancy what? The minister's learn to again repeats that you have to get a permit to remember from a Beijing. It's already three years after Beijing actually gave such permit, still there was no way to inform in a proper way. Or I think the Jew was afraid to inform governor's office or minister's office that he already made everything that was upon him from the point of Jewish law. He was not ready to show how the Jewish legal system functions and moreover much more faster than the state legal system. And it would, there would be no solution for this case if not the dialogue provision uh, that we find uh, the dialogue opportunity that uh, existed because of the rabbinical commission. When finally the next rabbinical commission was convened, the, 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 this, as one of the most difficult cases, was passed to this rabbinical commission. And they had no way but to repeat all the responses of learned Jews that had been assembled into this case earlier. But, and, and they already have drafted their decision, again saying you have to convene a rabbinical court. But it seems that the Jews were not afraid to inform the rabbinical commission at least about the fact that the, the, the rabbinical court, or court already was convened and already granted a permit. So, already after the draft of the decision of, in the case was prepared, a letter was sent to the, uh, to the rabbinical commission with information about the decision of Medin that took place five years ago. The draft had been amended and finally the rabbinical commission could simply rule that the state rabbi has to grant the permit. So, note that despite the fact that there was no communication at lower levels, at the level of rabbinical commission, there was a possibility to find language understandable both for Jewish legal system and for uh, the rabbis. So, I uh, would that suggest that uh, this is an example, not exactly of weak pluralism, which uh, would be like simply hierarchical submission of one uh, system to another, and it's not a case of strong pluralism when the systems simply do not see one another, do not, do not find any language in which they can start a productive dialogue. This is the critique offered by uh, Davis of Amsterdam. But I think this is a case that can, he uses, uh, I think this is a case that can be called flexible pluralism because there is a way for dialogue provided by both systems. The uh, state legal system could listen to a uh, rabbinical commission and could agree to advices and in particular court cases and general legislation. And Jewish law also, I'm not going to give an example right now, but in the tshuvas of, uh, of the period around the time of actual proceedings of rabbinical commission, we see, for example, of Rabbi Tzli how he says that we should choose this or that way in adjudicating a case also of another ever Meravonium, because rabbinical commission would help us in this way, but in that case it would not uh, let us act. So these preferences of rabbinical commission also influenced actual tshuvas of Rabboni who had no intention to publish their uh, short letters at that time when they were writing. So they influenced Jewish legal system inside in the part which it was not intended in any way to censure or whatever. Uh, so, if you permit, I'll just end with another, uh, with a small anecdote 
uh, which would be like a preface to Lenin's uh, presentation. Uh, there was a when Rabbi Yaakov Mazov of uh, Moscow uh, took his office in 1893, he had to uh, present himself to the authorities. The main uh, official in Moscow was uncle of the Tsar, Great Prince Sergei Romanov. <coughs> so after uh, Rabbi of Moscow had talked to all top officials except this Great Prince, uh, he asked of the Ministry of Interior officials if he should come to the Great Prince. And the, uh, the civil servant told him he will check. <clears throat> so Rabbi Mazo, of course, was his main uh, person in the community, was the president of the community, Lazar Balikov, who built two historic synagogues that you are going to see tomorrow. Uh, and uh, so Rabbi Mazo, when he received finally a letter inviting him to, the, uh, to attend, uh, to, to visit Great Prince Sagaramanov, he came to Lazar Palikov. And uh, uh, Lazar Palikov met him with uh, screaming Mazantov, as you can see, and he was dancing uh, almost uh, uh, being happy that the prince is going to receive newly uh, appointed rabbi of the city. But uh, the Rabbi Mazo had to uh, consult whether, uh, how he should come to the great prince. So uh, Mr. Palikov agreed to lend him his carriage and advised him to come not in traditional Jewish car, but <coughs> attention in, in a civilly accepted uh, uh, frat. As you, uh, uh, in uh, something culturally more acceptable. And uh, Rabbi Mazov, who was, by the way, also an alumni of this uh, faculty, he said, okay, I have such a garment, so I need only carry it from you. The garment I can take care of myself. And when he came to the, um, uh, to the Great Prince, they had a very long conversation. The Great Prince was very happy that he meets someone who volunteered in the Russian army uh, and uh, even this great prince who wasn't the biggest friend of Jews after her hearing that uh, uh, this is the case he started to talk a little bit more friendly and then he was happy to hear that uh, he visited also Jerusalem uh, with his another uh, as a part of Russian imperial uh, expedition there interestingly but then he came with a question why are you coming to me dressed not as a rabbi? And you see, uh, Rabbi Maso answered uh, that neither according to laws of the state nor according to Jewish laws uh, he has to appear in a special rabbinic garb. To what the great prince answered, he agrees, but uh, uh, he agrees to this, but still, even the custom is a law. To this, Rabbi Mazov had nothing to answer uh, and uh, said he will be happy to put on his rabbinic garb the first time after being specifically ordered to do so by the great prince. And uh, so the great prince answered that he would also be happy. Gamani uh, smart, as you see. But uh, and this uh, um, episode in memories of Rabbi Mazov ends with the story how he came back to Polikov. And when he heard that his advice was not maybe the best one he ever gave, uh, uh, Polikov uh, said, so you are not going to ask my advice anymore. Polikov's wife, who was from a very like, uh, orthodox family, answered, no, definitely he will ask him the opposite way. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, I think here we can come to a situation when uh, this is a hint of what can be when there, uh, there is not only recognition of Jewish law, but a reflection of Jewish law in, uh, in the customs and laws of the, of the country, but not reflection of the kind of the forbidden kind, which is Eida uh, Mishpotim, but a reflection of the kind which is we expect, hopefully, which is uh, to bring Ten Commandments into Ten Atlas. Thank you very much.